Yes, we're finally bottling the barley wine. Hey guys, so yeah, it's been a while. When did we start this? Two. Two 2020. 20. So February 20th of 2020. We racked it at some point? Yep. March 15th, we racked it. So this has been sitting since March 15th and it's now, today is April 30th. So we're looking at like six weeks. So all those people that get so concerned about leaving it, don't worry. Why did it take us this long to get here? We had this crazy idea to do a new brew every Friday and oh my god we have brews everywhere we can't keep up so because there's only seven days in a week and we really can't put out seven videos a week on this channel we've calmed down a little bit on that so this is just a little bit of backlog but anyway the first thing i want to do is get this lid off and as i'm doing this i'm trying to be notice she's holding it i want to be really careful to not disturb the lease in the bottom of this okay on the smell man this is good i mean just powerful stuff. It's going to be strong. It's going to be dark. It's going to be my kind of beer. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Barley wine is beer. It's just high alcohol beer. It's high proof beer. Um, we need some elevation. Just so happens, I have a box for all of our bottles that we have to use. So we're just going to put this up on top of the box of elevation. And I'm just going to put it into a pitcher. Now, as we do this in every bottling video, the reason I'm doing it into a pitcher instead of just bottling direct from this is first, there's lease in there. Second, I have to add priming sugar. But as always, we are going to rack this, which means taking a auto siphon, putting it in there, putting the other end into the pitcher, and she's going to make me start it. That way it's my fault if I get all the sediment in there. And we rack that simple okay so a note about using the buckets i started using them because that way you lose less product in the end this one ended up being just slightly below a gallon in the bucket and you know that's just the way brewing goes had i put this into a regular carboy i'd have much less and if i know i know that about here on this particular pitcher is a full gallon so i'm darn close to that full gallon mark that's important and that's why we brew that way there's no way I could have had all the solids and the brew bag and everything. It just it just doesn't work. So buckets are easier for doing beers and for smaller volumes when you don't want to lose too much and you still want to end up with a decent amount of product. What we're going to do now is take a reading on this because as I recall, last time it was at 1.052, which is a little high, okay? The reason why I was worried about that is because I thought either it got stuck or it's entirely possible there's so much unfermentable sugar in this because it is a beer that it's just going to end there. So we let it sit for six weeks and I wanted to know how it did. Okay, so we have a 1.038 final gravity here, which means it dropped, you know, about 14 points since the last time we looked at this. I'm going to say it's done, and if it's not, it's done, okay? <laughs> it's, it's been sitting for far too long. We need to get this in the bottle, carbonated, and make it safe. Beer can spoil. We do not want that to happen. However, am I a little disappointed? Yeah, I wanted this to be like 11 to 12%. It's like gonna be 9.3 with the half percent that I added for carbonation. Is that a real problem? No. But we have learned a lot since making this brew. And one of the things we've learned a lot learned a lot about is sugars. Yeah. So the types of um, roasts that we use may have actually created a higher percentage of unfermentable sugars in here, thus the higher yeah. sugar final gravity and the lower ABV rate. And that's why I'm okay with the 1038 final gravity because if 1010 to 1012 is normal for a typical beer, I pretty much tripled a typical beer. So that would be 1030 to 1036. We're at 1038. I'm okay with that. So I'm, I just want to give this a taste. It's very dark brown. It's like this odd looking, it looks chalky even. But our recipe was an ounce, or sorry, three to pounds, taste. two row. Very hoppy. This is like a dark IPA, I think is a great way to say yeah. it. We, we've, we've learned that we use too much hops. Can you tell that we don't make a lot of beer? <laughs> you know? Um, and somehow I got, okay, I have made recipes for beer for our, us to make that were three and five gallons. And I was using the same amount of hops in a three gallon and five gallon as I was putting into a one gallon. So it's pretty hoppy. Those of you that like hops, you're gonna love this one. It's got nice, rich, strong, caramely, roasty notes with the hops flavor there cutting through that. So this does not taste overly sweet. So 
as I was saying, three pounds of two row, one ounce black patent, one ounce roasted barley, one and a half ounce chocolate malt, and then an additional four ounces of two row, and then three hop additions at 0.4 ounces each. Each. Yeah, I probably could have used 0.4 ounces total and been fine for hops. So the roast on two row is a light roast, so that probably produced quite an amount sugars. of the fermentable sugars. But Black Patent, yeah. as its name suggests, roasted barley and chocolate malt are all a darker roast, meaning that they've converted in the roasting process many of the sugars into unfermentable sugars. Those are mostly there for flavor and color when you make, when you make beers. With and body. Those. And body, yep. All right, so this can go back into turbo. We also added an ounce of cocoa nibs, and we've had varying degrees of success success with yeah. cocoa nibs, and we I think we need to research that further. I, I, I got a little bit more chocolate in this because we left them in the brew, but it's still not a lot. I probably could have put three times as much in, and you probably still wouldn't have even really noticed it. And I think part of that is there is an element missing when you're trying to add a chocolate flavor to a brew, and we've Milk. noticed this, and other viewers have noticed this, that if you're trying to add a chocolate flavor to a brew, if you add a little bit of vanilla as well, oh. that enhances is the chocolate feel. It's a little late now. Otherwise, right, have right. you thought of that when we did yeah. this before? I might have added a vanilla bean to this to yeah. bring out that flavor. Yep, I think that would have been um, awesome. But what we're going to do next is we're going to carbonate this in the bottle. So that's called natural carbonation. Some people call it bottle conditioning. I don't like to use that term because it makes it sound like what we call secondary. So we're going to call it natural carbonation instead <laughs> and hope that sticks too. To do this, I use one ounce 28 grams of sugar. Now, can you use corn sugar? Absolutely. Can you use any other fermentable kind of product? Can you use honey? Of course you can. Why do I use regular table sugar? Somebody's going to ask because it's, it's not necessarily the best thing to do for priming, but it's convenient and I have a lot of it. And I don't buy corn sugar. We just don't. I, why don't I? Because I use the same sugar in my coffee, in my cooking, in my baked goods, and in my brewing just to keep life a little bit simple. Um, so Some people go. like to use a finer grain of sugar because it dissolves quicker, but we've, we've never had a problem with it dissolving. So. so, but basically that is my rule, 28 grams or one ounce per gallon of fluid. And this is close enough to a gallon that it's okay. Now to stir that up, my spoon of ridiculous size. It just, it, I, I keep saying we need to get the smaller one. But he wanted to buy a second one and cut it in half. And I said, you know, they make smaller ones. But it's okay because I'm the one, my job is to find, the store stuff. find all the stuff I just make things. on Amazon. Brian does all the other work. so we, we can I drink it. and I know things. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> I research and garden. That's what I do. I don't know. <laughs> and clean. I clean a lot. Yeah, I make a lot of messes. <laughs> What you didn't see was when I was putting the hydrometer in, I had too much it spilled all over the place. And of course my reaction made it spill even more. I cut that out though. <laughs> I want to make sure this is through thoroughly. Now again, just as in all of our bottling videos, I'm going to give the same speech that I always give. Uh, a lot of people like to put a little bit of sugar into each bottle and then pour it in. That works with one caveat. You need to be very, very, very precise with how much you're putting in there. That's why I like to put it all in here. That way I know every ounce has the same amount of sugar in it. If I was to try to measure that out, I mean, you know, I'm pretty good at measuring things, but even I'm going to be 10% off. 10% off could mean overcarbonation, could mean a bottle bomb. I don't mean to scare anybody, but that is something to be taken into consideration. Another thing to take into consideration when carbonating a beverage is you need two things in order to carbonate beverage. You need to have yeasts that are still viable and sugars that they're willing to eat. I guess three things. <laughs> I feel like uh, the Spanish Inquisition here. And I just need two things! <laughs> and you need to have the yeast have an alcohol tolerance so that they can continue because carbonation is a mini fermentation. A mini controlled ferment fermentation. Yeah. It's meant to only go so far. That's the idea. That way it keeps it safe. It creates the bubbles and then stops. All right, so when bottling, I'm going to take my auto siphon and put it into the liquid. Then 
going to use a bottling wand on the other end. And a bottling wand is literally just a tube with a little spigot on the end and a springy thingy. Some of them don't have the spring in there. I highly suggest the one with the spring. I had one without it and it used to get stuck and leaked and made messes that Derek had to clean up. So to get, get it on here, I just shove it on a good eh, half an inch or so. Any less and it could fall off. Trust me, learn from my mistakes. Any more and good luck getting it off later. If you have problems removing your bottling wand, a good yeah. trick is to run that section underneath a hot water. Yeah, just run under hot water. Um, and that'll loosen it up and make it easier to remove. Now, as in any siphoning procedure, this should be higher than this. In this case, you want to push down a little bit on the wand so that it actually starts. I'm going to hold it with one hand and show you how to do this with one hand. Watch. I'm being sneaky. You're being fancy. I'm See that? Hold, I'm going to hold it anyway just to make it easier. Well, if they have the clip, they can do it that way. Okay. And then it'll flow into the bottle. If I pif lift this up, it stops flowing. But I use the crotch method. <laughs> I, I'm not making a shirt on that. Someone suggested it. I'm not making a shirt on that. And it just literally means I hold them here so I can get to them very easily. You don't even need to hold that anymore. It's yeah. perfectly fine. And now it's not flowing. Okay. But if, you, if I push down, it will flow. Now, Brian has two bottles down there. <laughs> On purpose. On purpose. So that's, once the, the, the first one's full, he can quick switch over to the next one. How far do I fill it? I fill it until I can see the liquid up to about here. Then real quick, pull that wand out because the wand displaces some amount of the space. So that way you end up with it filling the neck to about there, which is perfect. I'm going to fill these bottles. See you when we're done. All right. Bottling is now done, but the video is not actually over, so stick around. What we want to do with these is we're going to put them into what we affectionately refer to as the bomb shelter, which is a plastic tub from Lowe's that has a, a tight-fitting lid. It's thick plastic, thick enough that if one of these was to explode, it probably won't go through and kill or hurt anyone or make a mess because we don't, you know, who wants to walk in their kitchen and have beer everywhere, let alone, you know, have a piece of glass sticking out of their face because they were cautious, weren't cautious. Will these create a bottle bomb? Most likely not because everything's been measured. We know it was done fermenting, therefore should be safe. There's always some amount of risk and that's why we like to just cover ourselves a little bit more in the actual carbonation process. How long will it take? This happens all the time. People freak out after two days. They don't have carbonation. And they wonder why. Carbonation can take two to three weeks. Depends on the temperature of your house. Depends on the alcohol level of your brew and it depends on the yeast you used as well as you know a million factors. So don't get crazy. Let these sit for two to three weeks. After that, what do you have to do with them? Nothing. You should drink them, <laughs> but you can put some in the fridge. You can leave them at room temperature. Ours tend to sit in the bomb shelter until we're ready to put them in the fridge. No harm there. They could, under rare conditions, if like say you bottled in winter and your house stays cold and it gets really hot in your house in the summer, they could overpressurize. So be careful with that. We tend to keep our house at about the same temperature year round because I like it cold. So it's not as much of an issue for us, but be careful of that, be aware. Generally speaking, a cool, dark place is all you need to do. Don't get crazy. They don't have to stay refrigerated. How long will they last in the bottles? Okay, this is another question we get all the time. If your seals are good, I would say I wouldn't let beer sit more than 15 to 18 months, which is a long time for beer it'll age it'll actually change over that time and aged beer can be quite good but beer is usually drank young so i wouldn't let it go longer than that not for spoilage reasons but for flavor reasons it should be able to last longer in theory but mm, beer aged not uh, yeah, weird so basically that's the gist you can keep these at room temperature keep them in the fridge whatever you want to do but don't freak out if they're not carbonated in like two weeks. How do we know if they're carbonated? You drink one. I just take it, throw it in the fridge, let it get cold, pop the top, and pour it. That's it. A note about popping the top. You want to be prepared in case they really got happy and got overly carbonated. Because you might have a little mini volcano. I wish we had a recording of it, but there was one. I think it was the small beer that I pushed the things. The whole housing just went flew off. <laughs> And it spurted this high. I mean, it was amazing. I've seen videos of this happening. I've never had it happen. It scared the crap out of me. I mean, I was like, whoa. 
but it was awesome and the beer was still good so um yeah we just got it into a glass really fast and you know it's all good but anyway as always thanks for watching guys and have a great day Bye bye